Hello and welcome to Nithrania Game Club. My name is Branislav Berec and you're watching Game in a Nutshell, the series of videos designed to teach how to play various board games. Today we're going to learn how to play the game called Coloma from Final Frontier Games. Place the game board in the middle of the table. Place this large rotating Barker tile so that it covers the site number 5 and cover the signpost symbol with this smaller bust tile. Place the year marker on the first space of the year track and place the corresponding number of the outlaws to the shootout place. Then place one barrel face up on each of these four rightmost spaces. Then place one barrel token face down on this leftmost space. Keep all other barrel tokens face down in a general supply. Then based on the number of players, place the gold nuggets into this gold supply. This is how it looks like for a three or four player game. Then place this mine card somewhere next to the game board. You can put the remaining gold nuggets back into the box. Then place a small stack of river tiles in this area. You don't have to place all the river tiles here, you can keep the remaining ones somewhere nearby. Then randomly select six unique types of these bridge tiles. In a two-player game, select only one tile of each type. In a three or a four-player game, take two tiles of each type and in a 5 or 6 player game, take 3 tiles of each type. Return all other bridge tiles back into the box. Take all the selected bridge tiles and place them onto this area on the game board. Randomly select 2 shootout chart tiles and stack them on the board covering the pre-printed chart. Then each player will take one player board. On the A side, all these bonuses on top of the board are the same for all players. B sides of the player boards are numbered and they have all these bonuses different for each player. Then each player chooses a color, takes the pioneer, one tent and two dudes of that color, plus the dial and all the cards of the same color. Place the wagons of all players to the Coloma city on this frontier map. Place the scoring markers of all players to the zero space of the scoring track. Then each player will take one gold from this top pool of the gold supply, then two bucks and one horse, and then the players will draw six cards from their deck. Then look at the cards, keep four of them, and place the remaining two either on top or bottom of the deck. You will never shuffle your deck in this game. To make the game a little bit more asymmetrical, each player can also take one Pioneer specialty card. Each card contains a special ability which players can use on their turn. Finally, randomly determine the starting player who will get this Sheriff badge. The game of Coloma is played over three years during the California Gold Rush period. Players are pioneers who are prospecting for gold and trying to build up their businesses. Players can earn victory points in multiple ways. They can prospect for gold and then change it for victory points, they can explore the frontier lands, they can survey the rivers and build bridges, and of course they can construct buildings or hotels. At the end of each year, players can also participate in this shootout and eliminate the outlaws threatening the city. That's also awarded with victory points. Whoever has the most points at the end of three years is the winner. Coloma is played over three years and each year has five rounds. At the end of the fifth round, there is a shootout. Then each of these rounds has seven steps. First, this Barker tile rotates to the next site, triggering this event. Then all players secretly select sites on their dials and then place their pioneers on the selected sites. Then the site which has the most pioneers busts. That means the bottom action is disabled. Then starting with the first site and then continuing in a clockwise direction, players will resolve their turns. After that, they would take their pioneers back and the round is over. At the start of the next round, the Barker tile moves to the next site and all the steps are repeated again. This happens five times for each site one time. Then in a shootout phase, simply compare the number of gunmen against the number of outlaws. When players outnumber these outlaws, they win, otherwise they lose the shootout. Then players will gain some rewards or penalties based on the current shootout tile 
and based on whether they have participated in the shootout or not. If they don't, they can permanently lose some dudes until the end of the game. And finally, at the end of each year, there's going to be a cleanup phase, which is basically a preparation for the next year. Now, let's take a closer look at one round of the year. First, rotate this bust tile so that it covers the signpost. Then, rotate both tile one side clockwise. In the first round of the year, it will cover the first side. In the second round of the year, it will cover the second side, and so on and so forth. Then, as the second step, trigger this event. Each player will get the listed benefit, so in this case it's two dudes. And if you have a tent at this site, you get this benefit twice. So, at the first site, players will get two dudes. At the second site, they will get one gold nugget. At the third site, they would draw two cards. At the fourth site, they would get two bucks. And at the fifth site, they can spend one gold nugget and get the three victory points. Then all players simultaneously and secretly select sites on their dials. Then they reveal the dials and place their pioneers onto selected sites. Players don't have to be quiet. Table talk is actually allowed during this selection. Now the site with the most pioneers will bust. Rotate this bust tile so that it covers the selected site. In case of a tie, and that includes this kind of tie, the bus style doesn't move and remains in its place. Then starting with the first side and continuing in a clockwise direction, players take turns. If there are more players on the same side, the player with the sheriff badge starts the first, then the player to the left of the sheriff and so on and so forth. On your turn you can perform actions. You can perform common action, which is the action depicted in this outer area of the wheel. You can perform boom action, which are actions depicted in this inner area of the wheel. And you can also trigger card abilities if you are at that particular site. I will describe all these actions in a minute. Then, when all players perform their actions, all the pioneers are returned back to their owners and the new round can begin. Before explaining all the actions in the game, we need to talk about some general rules. First, Anytime you need to gain some dudes or tents, you take them from a general supply and you add them to your lodge. There is no limit to the number of tents and dudes in your lodge, but the overall supply is limited. So if you need to gain more dudes and there are no more available in the general supply, you get no more dudes. The same applies for tents. Then there is also no limit to the number of cards you can have in your hand. If you have to draw more cards, draw them from your deck and add them to your hand. If you have to discard the card, you discard the cards either to the top or to the bottom of your deck. You never shuffle your deck. You can always spend gold as bucks, but you can never spend bucks instead of a gold. However, the value of your gold nuggets depends on the number of remaining gold nuggets in the supply. At the start of the game, the value of each gold nugget is 3 bucks. Then when there's no gold in the first pool, the value of the gold is still 3 bucks. As soon as you take the first gold from this second pool, the value of each gold nugget is only worth 2 bucks. As soon as the first gold nugget is taken from this bottom pool, the value of each gold nugget is 1. The value remains 1 buck even if there is absolutely no gold in the gold supply. When you spend gold, it doesn't go back to the gold supply. Instead, you have to put it into this mine card. The gold from the mine card will be returned back to the gold supply at the start of the next year. And finally, when you pay with gold and you overpay, you don't get back any change. When you perform actions at sites, you can always perform both the common, the boom action, and you can also trigger the abilities of the cards, which corresponds to the site where you have placed your pioneer. You can also trigger the abilities if you are on a Barker tile. You can perform these actions and abilities in any order you want. If the site is busted, you can always take the common action of the site, but the boom action is disabled. However, you can actually trigger the card abilities of that site if the site is busted. For example, in this case, 
you can trigger this ability and you can also trigger the bottom ability of this card because it corresponds to the second side and it corresponds to the boom action when it's busted. If you are at the side with the signpost, again the signpost disables the boom action of that side, but the signpost copies the boom action of the adjacent side in a counterclockwise direction. In this case, orange player can take the common action of this side, he can take the boom action of this side, but he can only trigger the abilities from the second side for this action. He is not allowed to trigger the card abilities of this boom action. Signpost can actually copy the bust tile as well. So in this example, the orange player can take this common action and he can trigger the bust ability of the second side. So he could easily trigger both abilities of this card. Now we will briefly explain all the actions in the game. When you place your pioneer on the Barker tile, you can buy tents and horses. You buy tents for two bucks and one horse for one gold nugget. As indicated by these blue arrows with an infinity symbol, you can repeat it as many times as you can afford. When you buy horses, take them from the general supply and place them in front of the lodge. As depicted here, you can have maximum six horses. Then the boom action of the Barker tile is the barrel action. When you take the barrel action, you can take one barrel token from this stash, either the face down or a face up. Then after choosing the barrel token, add this many outlaws to this shootout place. So in this case, that's two more outlaws. Then immediately refill this empty space with this face down token and add one more new face down barrel token from the general supply. You can use the action depicted on the barrel token anytime during your turn, even immediately after obtaining that tile. And when you do, flip the barrel token face down, but keep it in your player area. It may be scored or used later in the game. Only when you are instructed to discard that token, place it face up in the general supply. When you visit the first site, all you can do with this common and a boom action is to trigger the corresponding card abilities, including this Sutter Mill. When you visit the second site, you can either survey the river or build a bridge. When you survey the river, either pay the hammer cost if you take the common action or the saw cost when you take the boom action. Pay the indicated cost, so for the hammer action it was two dudes and two coins. Then you can take one of these river tiles and place it about one of these empty river spaces on your player board. When you do, you can immediately take the reward. These victory points will be scored at the end of the game. As you can see, you can have maximum four river tiles. If this supply of the river tiles would get empty, simply refill it with the general supply. Then the second option is to build these bridges. When you build the bridge, you either have to pay this hammer cost if you take the common action, and you have to pay this saw cost when you take the boom action. Then take one bridge from this display and place it above any river you have. You cannot place a bridge if you don't have the river tile yet. Bridges can score your victory points at the end of the game, but beware there is a maximum limit for each bridge. You can have maximum one bridge per one river and you can have maximum one bridge of each type. So at the end of the game, you can have four rivers and four different bridges. The number of bridge tiles is limited, so first come, first serve. When you visit the third site, you can build a town building. Again, you can either pay the hammer cost or the saw cost. For one action, you can select one card from your hand, pay the cost, either the hammer cost or the saw cost, which depends on the action you take, and then you can place the card either next to the Sutter's Mill or somewhere in the player area. Each card has a site associated with it, and when you have a pioneer at that site, you can activate its abilities, but you cannot do that the turn you build that building. When you visit the site number four, you can move your wagon on the frontier map. You can move it number of spaces equal or lower than the number of horses you have. When you start moving, you have to continue in that direction, you cannot reverse direction on the same move. However, if this was one move, on your next action, you can actually go back if you wish so. 
Whenever you move over or stop on one of these settlements, you get the depicted benefit. So in this case, I would get two dudes and one card. When you move over this boom town, you get the benefit listed on the left side. So in this case, I would get two dudes and four dudes. When you stop in the boom town, you can either get the benefit listed on the left side or on the right side. These horseshoes don't provide any benefits, but they count towards your movement limit. Each settlement or a horseshoe can only be occupied by one wagon. However, there can be multiple wagons in a boom town. If you have to move over the horseshoe or a settlement occupied by another wagon, pretend as if these spaces didn't even exist. So with the movement limit of four spaces, this orange player could go one space, second space, skipping, third space and four space. And he would get a gold nugget as a benefit and here he can choose either four dudes or one tent. When you visit the fifth site, as a boom action you can gain one tent and common action allows you to defend Coloma or place tents. So when you decide to defend Coloma, you will place your dudes as gunmen on these spaces against these outlaws. You have to take dudes from your lodge and fill one entire row. You can only fill one row per action. These dudes will remain here until the end of the year. When you decide to place tents, again, you have to take them from your lodge and place them onto events where you don't already have a tent or onto these colored frontier lands. To do that, you have to have a wagon in a boom town and follow these red arrows. So from this boom town, I can place a tent here and here. At the end of the game, players would score number of victory points equal to the number of tents they have placed onto these frontier lands. One region can contain maximum one tent of each color. The same limitation applies to the tents on events as well. At the end of the fifth round of the year, there is a shootout phase. In this shootout phase, simply compare the number of gunmen of all players to the number of outlaws. If the number of gunmen is higher than the number of outlaws, players win. Otherwise, they lose. That means that if there is an equal number of gunmen and outlaws, players lose. Then refer to this shootout chart for any rewards and penalties. Look at this left side if players win, look at the right side if players lose. Then the player with the most gunmen at the shootout will take this reward including the Sheriff badge, which means that player will be the first player for the next year. If there is a tie, the player who has the gunman nearest to the outlaws wins that tie. Then the player who has the second highest number of gunmen will get this reward, and then any other player who has at least one gunman will get this reward for the third place. Then all players who have not participated in the shootout, or if players lose, also the players in a third, fourth and fifth position, they will suffer a penalty of either one or two dead dudes. Dead dudes have to be placed on these graves on your player board. They have to come from the general supply and if you don't have enough dudes in a general supply, you have to take them from your lodge. Dead dudes will score you negative victory points at the end of the game. These dudes will remain dead for the rest of the game so that means you will have fewer dudes available in your general supply. At the end of the year, there's a cleanup phase. First, return all the gunmen and outlaws back into the general supply. Then remove the current shootout chart, move the year marker to the next year and place the indicated number of outlaws to the shootout place. Finally, refill the gold supply from the minecart and start with the bottom most empty spaces first. With that, you're ready for the next year. At the end of the third year, the game ends and proceed to final scoring. In addition to the victory points gained over the course of the game, add the victory points from all the buildings in your tableau, victory points for the rivers surveyed, and also the victory points for the bridge tiles. Please note, each bridge tile has the maximum number of victory points you can score from that particular bridge. Then lose the victory points for your dead dudes 
And finally, add the victory points for the number of tents on the frontier map. Whoever has the most victory points at the end of the game is the winner. There are two versions of a two-player game. In the standard one, place this neutral bust pioneer with his deck of cards somewhere near the game board. In addition, place the three dudes of a neutral color as gunmen in a shootout place, filling the third row. Before players select sides on their dials, randomly draw two cards from the Buster's deck, and these cards indicate that Buster will not visit these two sides. Then, after players reveal their choices, draw one more card from the Buster deck, and that's the side where Buster will be placed. Buster counts as a regular pioneer, so in this case, side number one would be busted. At the end of the round, when you return all the pioneers back to their owners, Shuffle all the Buster's cards together and create the new deck for the next round. Then in the shootout phase, these three neutral dudes count as if there was a third player in the game. So with this example, the gunman would outnumber the outlaws. The neutral third player would also score normally, so in this example, the neutral player would contribute with the highest number of dudes in the shootout. So the yellow player would potentially gain the benefit for the first player, however, the neutral player obviously doesn't receive any benefits. So the orange player would receive the benefits for the second place and the blue player for the third place. Then at the end of the shootout, all dudes of human players and all the outlaws are returned back to the general supply, but those three neutral dudes still remain in place. In the Mule Duel version of the two-player game, there will be no Buster Pioneer and obviously his deck of cards will not be used. Instead, both players will get one additional dial. In addition, they would also get one Mule and five Carrots. Take all the Carrots and place one Carrot of each color on each side. Then, when you move the Barker tile, the Barker does not trigger these events. When players select sites, they use the dials of their color for their pioneers, and then they use the secondary dials for their mules. Then, after revealing the dials, place the pioneers and mules to selected sites. When you place the mule on a site which still has the carrot of the same color, take that benefit. Again, if you have a tent at that site, take the benefit twice. Then, remove the carrot from that site because Mule simply eats that carrot. In addition, Mules count as regular pioneers, so in this example, the site number two is busted. At the end of the round, return all the pioneers and all the Mules back to their owners, and you can proceed to the next round. At the end of each year, take all the carrots that were eaten by your Mules, and refill all the sites with missing carrots. So, at the start of the next year, all sites will be refilled with carrots. And that's how we play Coloma. If you would have any questions or comments, please put them into the comment section below. I'll be more than happy to answer your questions. If you like the show, please like it, subscribe. My name is Branislav Berec, you've been watching Game in a Nutshell, and hope to see you next time.